So thank you very much, Joel, for the introduction. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining our webinar today um, on the topic of single particle analysis in multi-element mode using inductively coupled plasma time of flight mass spectrometry. So as you all know, uh, nanotechnology um, became a major part of manufacture of many known to us products like clothes, sunglasses, um, sunblocks, computers, you name it. However, despite its extensive use, uh, nanotechnology raises at least as many questions as it gives answers. And this is partially because analytics of nanomaterials is extremely challenging. So it tends to be very difficult to measure nanoparticles because usually you want to look at, the, at different properties um, in one run, like shape, size, size distribution, agglomerate, agglomeration state, surface properties, and so on. So there are many techniques out there, and usually they are all used in combination. And one of such technique, we, which is able to measure concentration, size, and composition of nanoparticles, when icp tof is used, is going to be a topic of our webinar today. And this is a single particle ICPMS. So for those of you who is not familiar with the method, let me briefly explain it. You start with a very diluted suspension or dispersion of nanoparticles and you introduce it into the plasma in the form of uh, micro droplets. You can form those micro droplets with alternative devices like micro droplet generators, but usually an, uh, a standard sample introduction system is used composed of a nebulizer and a spray chamber. So the suspension has to be diluted in the way that only a little fraction of these droplets contain particles and only one particle enter the ionization source at a time. So when a droplet containing particles enters the ICP, it undergoes the processes of vaporization, atomization, and forms the atomic cloud of ions, uh, which will be sampled from the atmospheric pressure ICP into the uh, mass spectrometer. The ions will be separated uh, according to the mass to charge ratio inside the mass analyzer and detected in the form of extremely short transient signals, which last usually uh, a fraction of millisecond. So what kind of information can we get from such kind of signals? From the signal intensity of this signal, we can deduce information about analyte mass in the particle. So it's important to emphasize here that ICPMS measures mass and not the size, but the size can be estimated if you know or um, assume particle density, particle shape and composition. And simply counting these single spike events, we can also uh, determine the particle number concentration. But in order to uh, have these two parameters, we of course need to calibrate our system. So the most straightforward way to calibrate the system is to use uh, reference particle materials. But those are unfortunately not available for all the systems of interest. And therefore, researchers had to come up with an alternative approach and Pace and co-workers from the group of uh, James Renville proposed to use solution to calibrate particles. So the idea is the following. The particles are measured in form of very short ion bursts and integrated usually within a certain time, which is in quadrupole world called dwell time. We call it integration time, but basically this is the same. Uh, but solution in contrast, it's introduced in, in the form of continuous flow of ions and forming a continuous signal like that. So if we assume that solution and particles behave in the same way in the sample introduction system and in plasma, and we know the mass, mass flux of our solution, so we know exactly how much is being introduced within this dwell time, and we know the signal, of this fraction of solution. So from these figures of merit, we can actually convert our signal intensity into element mass. The problem with this approach, but actually we don't know uh, how much of our solution is being introduced into the plasma. Because transport efficiency of sample introduction system is uh, very much dependent on operating conditions. And this is actually parameters that has to be measured. So the most straightforward way to measure this is to use waste collection where you just uh, simply weigh how much, how much solution was introduced and how much goes into the waste. And from this difference, you can calculate the mass flux. However, this method unfortunately doesn't work and usually uh, results in uh, underestimation of particle sizes. 
So based on co-workers proposed to use particles of any, actually any elemental composition of either known size or known particle number concentration. In most of the studies, uh, people use gold nanoparticles from NIST because those are the only particles well characterized available on the market. So the particle number concentration approach is very straightforward. You know how many particles are in your dispersion and you basically count how many you measured and from this ratio you can calculate the transport efficiency of the system. However, this method is uh, less commonly used because uh, the particle number concentration is not a very stable parameter. So to explain particle size method, I would like to use this diagram again, but just in a reverse uh, manner. So here you start with particles of gold and you have gold solution as well. So you start with particle of gold of a known size. So you can uh, calculate the mass of gold in these particles. And so you know the signal, you know the mass of the particle and here you know the signal. So you can, from this data, you can calculate the mass flux uh, you can calculate the mass of solution of gold introduced within dwell, dwell time. So, and then measuring the uptake of your solution, so you know how much goes into your system and you know how much is being measured, you can calculate the transport efficiency. So I decided to spend a couple of slides explaining this calibration approach because I think it's very crucial in order to get accurate data in single particle ICPMS. And because, uh, for example, particle size method uh, was used throughout some of the studies I'm going to show you today in this webinar. Okay, so uh, another issue with single particle ICPMS is uh, particle detection. Uh, almost all commercial mass spectrometers, ICP mass spectrometers, are based either on the quadrupole or sector field mass analyzers. Uh, the limitation of these two mass analyzers is that they measure only one isotope at a time, which means you can look only at one single isotope per particle. So some modern um, fast quadrupoles exist on the market, like one from Perkin Elmer from next in a next ion next ion instrument. Um, but unfortunately, they, they can measure two isotopes per particle, but they can they can give only qualitative data. So, uh, so these mass analyzers can look only of, uh, at the particles of um, single composed of single element. But the world is not as simple, and in most of the studies, you usually uh, interact with particles which are uh, multi-component and much more complex. And this is where time of light comes into play. And in the time of light technology, the ions are measured in uh, very short packages, so they are extracted in short packages in, in the field-free time-of-flight tube. And while they fly through, they separate um, according to their mass-to-charge ratio. In the way that lighter ions uh, heat detector the first and heavier the last. So this uh, process happens in the fraction of, uh, of a microsecond, but within these few microseconds, few tens of microseconds, you actually measure all isotopes from even a single particle. Which means that this technology opens an uh, entire new world where you can look at uh, more complex samples and more complex particles. So in our ICP TOF technology is based on this kind of time of light mass analyzer. I don't want to go too much in, into detail in um, hardware of the instrument. And if you are interested in detail, I refer to uh, our previous webinar given by my colleague Martin Tano. Please check it on our website. We have also a video recording of that. But just briefly, our ICP TOF is based on the IQPQ instrument from uh, Thermo Scientific. So we start with, with their sensitive and robust uh, plasma interface and optics. And we put our notch filter technology in place of the original uh, analyzer quote and the detector. We need notch filter in order to get rid of uh, most abundant plasma background interferences. And on the top, we put orthogonal time of flight mass analyzer, which has an extractor and a special lens called Reflectron and a fast detector in order to improve the resolution or mass resolution of, of, of the analyzer. So I would like just to list some properties uh, of, of the instrument, which I think are important for single particle detection. So because we start with uh, sensitive optics, 
And the uh, ICP interface of the ICAP queue, we can reach detection limits uh, for pure metallic particles in the range from 10 to 100 nanometers. So usually time of light has much higher resolution what, than what quadrupoles offer and our ICP TOF instrument has a resolution of 3000 and our new product ICP TOF 2R has a resolution of 6000. Uh, there is another option to deal with interferences, which is a collision reaction cell in the form of Q-cell, and I will focus on uh, ways of dealing with interferences uh, a bit later in this webinar. So the notch filter can be also used for removing some matrix ions coming from your sample, and mass accuracy of, uh, of a TOF is uh, five uh, millisomsons, which allows you to discriminate, qualitatively discriminate analyte of your peak from interferences. So you can check this recent publication uh, from Lindsay Hendricks from the group of Professor Detlef Günther if you want to know more uh, details on figures of merit of, the, of this instrument uh, for the measurement of single droplets and single particles. But these properties are important, but very important uh, and valuable features are speed and simultaneous detection. So the ions uh, produced from uh, from a single particle, usually having a Gaussian shape, are measured, as I mentioned, in little packages, which means that even a signal from single particle can be still detected time result, and every of these single point will, con uh, will contain information from the entire mass spectrum. Let me, show you, let me show you practically what that means on this example. Excuse me. So here you have a signal of, um, of a particle composed of chromium, iron, nickel, and molybden measured with ICP TOF. And on this graph, you see how this signal would look like if it was measured sequentially. So this data is simulated data without considering the settling time, which is rather a realistic case. But anyway, so again, in contrast to sequential detection, when you have TOF, you, don't, you do not change the sensitivity with increasing number of isotopes per particle. You can measure um, uh, isotope ratios accurately. And another important feature is that you don't need to decide once you, what you want to measure prior to the measurement, which is very beneficial for, for example, unknown samples. So speed and simultaneous detection are important features. Another interesting feature of ICP TOF is that it combines two different technologies to deal with interferences. Some challenging particles like iron dioxide, silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, or some sulfide particles are very uh, difficult to measure. And usually you would like to measure the most abundant isotopes as listed in this table. But exactly those isotopes are interfering with uh, some, uh, I, uh, some polyatomic ions formed in plasma like argon oxide, nitrogen, and oxygen. And you usually need this kind of uh, mass resolving powers in order to separate these two peaks. So I show the numbers here, which were calculated using full reset health maxima of the peak in order to be comparable with the numbers we usually report for TOF. So in ICP world, you either go for higher mass resolving power, which is the case for sector field instruments, or you have a collision reaction cell technology, which, which is usually used in quadrupole mass spectrometers. In TOF, we combine both. So we have a mass resolving power, as I mentioned, of 3,000 and 6,000. And here on, on this graph, you see how well peak of iron can be separated from argon oxide using either icp tof or icp tof 2 r So in case if this resolution is still not sufficient or sensitivity of the interfering peak is extremely high and the analyte peak is just uh, lost in the shoulder of this very intense peak, there is another option of using collision reaction cell. So there are two ways of using collision reaction cell. We can either pressurize, pressurize it with uh, inert gas, and in this way we can uh, start uh, collisionally focus, uh, focusing the ion collisionally. So uh, and with this we can improve the resolution and sensitivity as well, especially for heavier ions. But if this doesn't work, there is an option of using reactive gas, which means inducing a specific chemical reaction as shown on this case, for example. So if you use hydrogen, you can completely neutralize argon oxide ions and measure iron peak free of argon oxide interferences. 
So this was about the features of the instrument. Now have, let's have a look what these features uh, mean for real applications. So because the measurement happens simultaneously, uh, Along with size and concentration, we can also look at the composition of single particles, and uh, which is shown in this example. So we try to validate how good we can measure elemental composition in collaboration with uh, Steffi Böhme and uh, Ruth uh, Peters from Rikild. So we had nanosteel uh, nanoparticles um, which were synthesized for nanodefined project. We use hydrogen in the collision reaction cell in order to improve iron detection by removing argon oxide interferences. And here you see a transient signal of one single steel particle. So if we look at the um, intensity distribution of iron, for example, we see that particles are very much polydispersed in size, as this histogram shows. But if you look at the ratios, at the elemental ratios, they are much more monodispersed. So we use those ratios in order to calculate the mass fraction of uh, all these four elements in single particles. We quantified these ratios using a multi-element solution standards and using, uh, we calculated the molar ratio using 100% normalization approach. So you assume you do have only these four elements in the particle and nothing else. So here you see the results. Um, we could get uh, molar fractions, except maybe for molybden, which, are, which were in the range of what uh, was expected. So the take home message from this slide is that if you're not interested in absolute mass of your analyte, you can basically, or just, you just want to look at the elemental ratio in single particles, you basically can just use multi-element solution, uh, solutions to do that. You don't need to, to go through all this process of transfer efficiency. So this is example of a synthetic system. Now let's move to more interesting and challenging environmental cases. So detection and monitoring of particles after they are released into environment is extremely important in order to assess the impact. And this is a very challenging problem because it can be compared with like looking for a needle in a haystack. Some particles are relatively easy to measure, but some are extremely difficult, like cerium dioxide, titanium dioxide, silicon oxide, aluminum, copper, and zinc oxide, because those elements are present in the environment at extremely high concentrations, and they are not homogeneously distributed. And the most importantly, they also present in form of natural nanoparticles, which are often very similar in properties to engineered ones. So we need a good technique and we don't have that one to look for this needle in a high stack, except maybe uh, scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. Therefore, Professor Frankfurt and Kammer a few years ago came with the idea to use single particle ICPMS for this purpose. In the way that we can look um, at the elemental composition or elemental fingerprinting of single particles and based on that separate particles from different sources. So here is an example of the study they designed first. They looked at cerium dioxide nanoparticles, which are usually used as uh, polishing agents or additive for fuels. So they look at those particles in soil. They designed the study where they spiked uh, cerium dioxide, engineered cerium dioxide in soil at different levels, starting from the concentration way below the natural background and going up. Then they extracted those particles and look how well they can recover the concentration of engineered ones. And they looked at the, uh, they assumed in this study that cerium dioxide uh, engineered ones are pure, they contain only cerium, but the natural ones can contain, for example, lanthanum and other rare earth elements as known from the literature. So this study was done in collaboration with ATH Zurich, and this graph now summarizes their results. In letters, you see uh, concentration fractions, uh, the ratio of engineered nanoparticles to natural nanoparticles. So they first tried to look at this data manually, so assigning the particles to engineered one, ones if it has only cerium, and if it has lanthanum on it, assigning it to natural nanoparticles. As you see from these first bars, the level of uncertainty was extremely high in this assignment. And therefore, they decided to use a more sophisticated statistical data treatment using uh, machine learning algorithms, which take into account not only one parameter, but several ones, so looking also at other uh, elements occurring uh, together with serum and natural particles. So their conclusion was that they can 
determine the concentration of engineered cerium dioxide way much below uh, the natural background. And this is uh, shown in this graph. The, the recovery level was also very good. The concentration should be decreasing one order of magnitude. The beauty of this approach um, is that it doesn't require any labeling. And in addition to uh, engineered nanoparticles, it also provides some information on the particulate natural background, which is also very valuable. So this is just uh, one example, but in principle, these logics can be used for other systems as well, like for example, titanium dioxide particles. And this example com comes from the same group, from Andreas Kontigas, who looked at titanium dioxide uh, from sunscreens uh, released in the lake water. So this was not the design study, but they really picked up a lake in, in, Aust in Austria and looked uh, at the uh, change of concentration of titanium dioxide particles all over the year. And uh, from their previous study, they knew that, for example, titanium concentration and titanium to aluminum ratios increase during the bathing season, so when, uh, in summer. And number of concentration, uh, uh, number concentration of particles bearing titanium increases as well. So they wanted to see whether this signature, this ratio signature, really um, um, remains when you look at single particle, single particles. So we got uh, to analyze uh, uh, two samples, one on season, one off season, and here you see on this graph the elemental ratio distribution of titanium to aluminum. So it's, uh, you can see from this graph that there is no a change, though there is no difference between these two samples. But we saw some difference in the ratios of titanium to manganese and lead, but for aluminum we didn't see any difference. But what we saw that the, uh, the elemental ratio on single particle level is very different from what was determined in bulk off-season and on-season as well, and uh, different from sunscreens. So the conclusion from this study was that there is no a defined element signature or fingerprint that can be used uh, to look for these titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And there were too many titanium, natural titanium dioxide particles, which were pure as well. So it was a very challenging task to find out how many of titanium dioxide from sunscreens um, end up in the lake. What was interesting also in this study that we could detect um, some other elements, uh, iron, manganese, and lead. And detection of lead on nanoparticles actually supports an uh, early proposed theory that nanoparticles can, be can, can act as a um, mediator or transfer for, for lead um, distribution in the environment. All right, so this was about engineered nanoparticles. Now let's talk about particles which are formed in vivo. In this study, we tried to look at the process of formation of mercury selenide particles in, in the pilot whales in collaboration with, uh, with the group of uh, Professor Jörg Feldman. Let me, let me spend a couple of words on the background of this study. So um, methyl mercury is very toxic to the body and selenium is believed to play a role of a protector, converting this toxic compound into biominerals like uh, mercury selenide, for example. So it does a good function, but it also believes that this process leads in selenium depletion in the body, which means it can also have negative effects. But the mechanism of formation of this mercury selenide is still not understood. So uh, the researchers from, professor, uh, from the group of Professor Fjord Feldman had a chance to look at this uh, process using a population of stranded pilot whales. And uh, here you can see, you can find the details on their study and they used a combination of different techniques to look at this process. And I show you here the summary of single particle ICPMS using quadrupoles. So they, they saw that um, size of particles as well as concentration of particles containing either uh, mercury or selenide increased with the animal age, as shown here. And synchrotron micro XRF imaging uh, revealed that large clusters um, of a five micrometer like this shown in yellow have a ratio very close to one, but very small clusters shown here in blue have uh, the ratios uh, below one, significantly below one. 
So they proposed that uh, they explained this ratio by selenium rich structures, which might play a role of, uh, of a co centers for further grow of these particles, which with grow will approach eventually the ratio of one. So this data was acquired at the pixel size of 800 nanometer, and we wanted to have a look at the, uh, this uh, mercury to selenite ratio at the single particle level. And we got a sample particle extract from a liver from one of the animal. And our finding was that um, most of the particles are in the range from 40 to 100 nanometer. So the mean ratio found in single particles is about 0.7. And we indeed saw, as shown on this graph, that there is a certain increase of uh, molar ratio of mercury to selenite with the size of the particles. So those findings actually are in agreement with what was uh, published already in this paper. But interestingly, we also saw iron and cadmium in these particles, which wasn't expected. And actually, it's a, it's a significant fraction. So the iron we think might come from fragments of cells bound to particles, but the mercury, uh, sorry, uh, the cadmium probably uh, can be a, the particle as well, like cadmium selenide, for example. So it's still unclear at that stage whether uh, iron and uh, cadmium are just artifacts of sample preparation or they really they are really a valuable piece of information that can be used to elucidate the mechanism of formation of mercury selenide. But this study actually shows how easy important information can be overseen when you do not measure all the isotopes simultaneously and you have to decide what you want to measure prior to the measurement. So these examples were about nanoparticles in liquid, but basically nothing stops us to looking at single particles in different matrices, like for example, air. So usually to measure metal content in airborne particles, people collect the aerosol on the impactors, then they go back to the lab, they, they dis dissolve them with acid and measure um, bulk concentration. So it's a very time consuming method. And it's of course beneficial to be able uh, to monitor those particles online because it's faster, it has higher uh, time resolution, it uh, has a lower detection limits and introduce much less contamination, contaminations. And it's, it's, it's possible nowadays using uh, this uh, gas exchange device uh, developed by Kohei Nishiguchi. So here you see a schematic of this device. Um, the main purpose of it, to transport the nanoparticles uh, into the plasma as efficient as possible, and at the same time exchanging sampled air with the argon, because otherwise air is not compatible with the ICP. So we had a chance to test one of those devices. We connected to, to our ICP TOF and tried to measure nanoparticles from, from a car exhaust. So we couldn't take a car into the lab. So we had to go to the car with a special gas sampling bag. We collected some exhaust when car was running and some environmental air around. And we could detect some particles containing platinum and iridium as shown on this graph. So you see the level of um, signal from platinum and iridium coming from environmental uh, air was somewhere like that. And those spikes are the particles. So in principle, and that's what we could show as well, that you you can use the same calibration approach in order to convert those spikes into size and also uh, uh, deduce some information about concentration from this. As well as looking at the ratio of uh, elemental ratio in single particles as shown on this histogram. So we suspect that platinum and iridium coming from a, a, either catalytic converter or ignition spark plug because uh, those compartments actually usually are manufactured uh, from these two elements. So this is just, you know, I show you this example just to give you a flavor of what kind of things you can do with single particle ICPMS also in other application fields. So you can imagine that you can look also at serum dioxide particles coming from the uh, fuel in the exhaust, for example. So we can also look at nanoparticles in um, soft tissues for using laser ablation imaging. So this will allow us to, to locate particles, for example, after, after the exposure and would be very useful in toxicity studies. So in this example, um, a suspension or containing aluminum, titanium and uh, uh, zircon oxide particles was instilled in the red lung and was incubated for three days. And the animal was sacrificed and uh, the, 
um, the lung was sliced in thin sections. And those six thin sections were analyzed by laser ablation coupled to the ICP-12 as well as fluorescent microscopy. So here you see the overlay of a microscopy images with uh, data from the ICP-12. So you can locate the particles. And uh, in addition, actually, this sample was also um, labeled with gold, or the macrophages actually in the, in the lung was labeled with gold and fluorescent dye. So here you see the picture of uh, fl a fluorescent picture. And here you see the gold coming from laser ablation. So if you overlay particle, signal with the gold signal you see that most of the particles here shown in in yellow are eaten by macrophages which is well fact a well known fact in the literature so i unfortunately don't have time to spend much on laser ablation applications but i would like to uh, refer to our next webinar on applications of laser ablation with icp tof which will be given by my colleague Yanni Pusweil. so you're welcome very welcome to join so these images were performed at five micrometer resolution, but nowadays even imaging of single cells is possible. So this was the last application I wanted to show you. And uh, I tried to explain some features, present you some features of our instrument, which I think are important for single particle analysis, such as simultaneous detection, which give us an information about all isotopes, even in single particles, and open completely different world for single particle ICPMS applications. Flexible interferences control, which allows us to deal, uh, which gives us a certain flexibility in dealing with uh, different interferences and measuring challenging particles. Sensitivity, which is sufficient to measure particles in the size range from 10 to 100 nanometer. Mass accuracy, which can help to qualitatively distinguish analyte peak from interfering peak and speed which increases signal to noise ratio and uh, improves the detection limits. So with that I would like to thank all our collaborators, Rikild, University of Vienna, University of Aberdeen, University of Münster, ETH Zurich, ESI, New Wave, um, G Science Lab and ACE Nano and I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today and for listening. And uh, uh, if you have any questions or you want to know specific details about some studies I have presented today, please don't hesitate to contact me or, or my colleagues. And if you have any immediate questions, I will be, of course, happy to answer those. So thanks a lot. Great. Well, thank, thank you very much, Olga. Uh, and I'm just going to remind anybody, if you want to ask a question at this point, uh, there is a question and answer uh, button on your screen where you could type some questions. Uh, for the moment, there are actually is not there are not any questions yet. So maybe we'll hold on here just a few seconds in case somebody somebody is waiting or uh, in the process of typing something. Um, okay, it doesn't doesn't look like it. Uh, well, in that case, uh, thank you again to everybody for joining us. Today. Oh, we do have a couple questions coming in. I just didn't wait quite long. Enough. There we go. Let me see what we have. Um, there was uh, one question that came in here is, uh, what are the detection limits specifically for metal oxides? So we look, thank you very much for the, for the question. Um, so it depends of course on the element that you are uh, interested in. For example, uh, for cerium dioxide particles, it will be somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 nanometers. For titanium dioxide, which are more challenging, it will be maybe in the range of 30 to 40 nanometer, depending, of course, uh, on the sample of interest. If you have some ionic background in the sample, it will, of course, increase your detection limits. Uh, for iron dioxide, iron oxide nanoparticles, using hydrogen, we could show detection limits of 43 nanometer. So yeah, this is this all the numbers I have now uh, at that point in mind. But you can contact me maybe per email. I will send you more information regarding this question. Okay. The, the follow-up question there, is there possibility or methods that those detection limits might be lowered in the future? Yes, uh, we are working on that, of course. Um, uh, you know, as, uh, this is uh, the main requirement of single particle ICPMS. The instrument has to be sensitive in order to look at nanoparticle sizes of nanoparticles, which are uh, um, which are more interesting for this research. Okay, um, and then we have two two questions, which are are, are 
similar. Um, so I will read each of them and you can decide. So what one person asked, how are we sure that only one particle is entering at a time? And related, uh, another attendee is asking, how do you make sure that particles do not cluster during the introduction into the ICP TOF? Thank you very much. This is a very <laughs> interesting question. So um, let me first uh, answer the first part. Um, how can you be sure that only one particle enters at a time? So you just statistically try evaluate and adjust your dilutions accordingly. So you just try to, so you know exactly um, your dwell time in which dwell time um, particle arrives and uh, from the entire measurement time you can use using Poisson statistics you can calculate uh, what will be the concentration you have to be introduced in order to avoid double and triple events. Uh, the second part of, of, of the question how can you be sure that two particles are not sticking together and entering the ICP? This is uh, a limitation, I would say one of the limitations of the IC, IC, single particle ICPMS. It's difficult to distinguish because when these particles will stick together, you will also see the, the signal coming from two particles and it will be very difficult to distinguish these two. Then you would try to maybe um, work on your dispersion, try to resuspend the particles and see if there is any change and this might be an indication that there was some agglomeration in the sample. Yeah, I think. Okay, um, a question about a possible, a specific sample. It would be possible, how can I prepare sample of blo a blood sample for nano titanium dioxide? Um, is, is the question, is it possible to prepare a sample of blood? I must admit, I don't have myself experience with blood samples and titanium dioxide particles in them, but, um, um, and I must admit as well that I need to look closer into the literature to see if there is anything available there already. But uh, usually those kind of samples, organic samples, you um, enzymatically digest and then you can restabilize the particles. There are some protocols how to measure organic samples. What I can also imagine that if there is a suitable sample introduction system, you, can, you might not need to do that so you may maybe with diluting the blood samples enough in milk water or in any other media you can maybe introduce those cells even directly and look at how, how these titanium dioxide particles bound to those cells for example okay um another question here is it possible to measure sulfur um, yes, thanks for the question. It is um, always possible to measure sulfur. Um, the main problem with sulfur is that there is a very intense oxygen peak, peak ne next to it and uh, also sulfur in water and everywhere you have a certain level of contamination. Up to now we could show detection limits of uh, like 10 ppb. So uh, not that low detection limits, but we are working on it and uh, now in the process of investigating the capabilities of icp 2 r for specifically for sulfur detection. I hope we can provide more information later on online on this topic. Um, I'm just, there's a couple, couple here trying to figure out what order to put these in. Um, do you assume the particles are spherical in shape during your calculations? Um, yes, so in all the examples I showed you where I tried to calculate the size, I did assume that particle has spherical shape. But this is not, um, as I mentioned, you measure mass with ICP. Uh, you can't measure size, and size you can only estimate. So you always would need some complementary technique in order to fulfill this information. But in principle, you don't need to always assume that this is sphere. If you know that your particles, for example, part, your particles are cube, for example, you can also calculate the shape using the cube. Um, a question here: you, you showed that the minimum dwell time. Uh, so I think this, by this I mean the top pulsar, the the pulsar period is 30, 30 microseconds. Is there a dead time between these adjacent integration time windows? Uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's a really good question. So we have uh, uh, two modes uh, for measuring nanoparticles. If you want to measure all the elements all the time continuously, there is a limitation there because we collect the entire mass spectrum. Per single mass spectrum, we have 40,000 points. So we need a certain computing power to transfer this data. And if you want to measure continuously, you can, you, you can go down to one millisecond. This would be the minimum integration time without any losses of the data in that time. 
There is another way of measuring nanoparticles data is to use internal triggering. So we have a certain system, as so we have a certain internal trigger. Uh, if you set it up, it will measure the particle only if there is a signal. And in this case, you can also reach uh, the acquisition duty cycle of 100% and at the same time staying with 30 microsecond uh, time resolution. Exactly. Yeah. So, just, so just to be clear, in that mode, you are getting a, a unique mass spectrum every 30 microseconds without dead times between adjacent. Yeah, for example, this signal that I show you for nanosteel particles was exactly detected in this mode. So you see, we can detect time resolved. We can detect time resolved signal of single particle without any losses in between. Between the data points, I mean, sorry. Great, great, great. And then a couple, uh, a couple more questions. Um, if more than one particle is detected in a given dwell time, how do we validate the result? Uh, and the same person asks, asking, what is the optimum transport efficiency value? So let me start with the second question. Thank you very much for, for it. Um, the transport efficiency of a standard sample introduction system of, of the IQQ instrument, which we are using, is in the range of uh, three to six percent, depending on on the operating conditions. But this is uh, you are not limited to this system. So there are many, many different uh, nebulizers and spray chambers commercially available, which you can buy, which can produce much higher transport efficiency. There are also high efficiency nebulizers, which can reach up to hundred uh, percent transport efficiency, I believe. And it was also shown in the literature. So, Joel, what was the first question? Could you please repeat? Uh, the first question is, if more than one particle, wait, if one particle is, oh, excuse me, if one part, I, I misread it, I think. If one particle is detected in more than one dwell time, how do we validate the result? Uh, my understanding of this question is, if a particle detection event lasts longer than the 30 microsecond dwell, how do you validate it? And, and maybe you can actually go back and show the figure, which shows that this is actually always the case. That, that particles extend across multiple dwells? Ah, so you split the particle kind of between two dwell times. Yeah, yeah, which is what you, those, tra those transients that you showed earlier in your talk. I think that's, maybe that's where the question is going. So of course, if you measure with a certain dwell time, like let's say we have one millisecond and we measure particles in one millisecond. Maybe important to mention that in the first instance, you try to prepare your experiment in the way that you basically um, uh, minimize uh, those double events per dwell time. Because if you have double events per dwell time, and if it's one millisecond uh, uh, integration time, this is not will be single particle ICP MS anymore. So most likely your dilution was not sufficient. But if you have a split between two dwell times, for example, this is not really a problem because you can add these two signals together and integrate them again. So you, the frequency of your particles in ICPMS is usually between 10 and 50 particles per second. And so you can, you, and, and the data points, you have a thousand data points in this second. So the particles will be split on this time scale very well. Like there will be background gaps in between. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. And then I think we've come to, there's, there's a couple other questions which I may um, have you follow up with offline. But maybe the last one here, because there's two questions that are quite similar, I will read you both. Uh, it says, uh, thank you. And how do you make sure that the particle is completely ionized? And a similar question uh, is, do you perform mass balance? How to make sure a particle is totally atomized in the plasma? So maybe you can comment on what we, what we know about the, the ionization. This is a very good question. I really like the question. So yeah. Um, let me start with the fact that you can find uh, some uh, 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 publications in the literature which says that basically it's very easy to ionize a nanometer particle. Everything below a few micron, um, no problems ionizing it. So if you're not sure whether you ionize particle or not completely, my approach would be, for example, to try to change the sampling depth of, or, of uh, of a torch, so you try to bring the sampler closer to the torch or more away, and if you don't see any change in intensity, most likely you are completely ionizing your, uh, completely vaporizing and ionizing your particle, for example. But I wouldn't expect a um, big difference uh, for, especially as, at least for a standard sample introduction system where you have a lot of uh, solvent introduced. I didn't see a significant uh, I didn't see any indication for particles not being completely vaporized and ionized. Okay.
Okay. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the question and answer. And, and with that, we will, um, with that, we will end the webinar. So thank you again to everybody for joining. And as we mentioned earlier, both this webinar and uh, part one, which covered the fundamentals and, and instrumentation, uh, will be available on our website within the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you.